Okay. So the goal of today's lecture is a little bit different from the other days. So what we want to do today is to compute an intersection uh, exponent for Brownians. So you consider two Brownian motions that are starting on this small circle of radius epsilon. Take them, they start uniform on this uh, small circle. And you want to know the probability that they do not intersect before exiting the, the ball of radius 1. OK. So that was one of the questions why uh, SLE was introduced. And I mean, one of the first achievements. I will not be able to, to do the complete proof, but at least I hope I will, have, I will give you an, an intuition of what is going on. So the first thing that we are going to do, we are going to play a little bit with conformally invariant objects. Because so far, you saw, already two, you saw only two kinds of conformally uh, invariant objects, the Brownian motion and the SLE. So this morning, you had an idea about uh, restriction measures, but that was the first time you heard about something else. So let's consider the following problem. You consider. Uh, say, so the equilateral uh, triangle, and with a small um, triangular grid on it of size 1 over n, and you send a random walk, which has the following, the following property. Inside, it's just a simple random walk. It jumps with, rate one over six, with probability 1 over 6 on one of its neighbors. But on the boundary, it does something different. It goes once, 1 over 6 here, 1 over 6 here, 1 over 6 here. It goes on itself with probability 1 over 6. And it goes along the boundary with probability 1 third. So like the, on the boundary, it does not behave like a simple random walk. Question, what is the behavior? What, what is the law of the coordinate? the coordinate x, so this one, at time n. So what is the law of xn at time n? So there is a law like this. I'm just looking at this coordinate. Does somebody has any guess? No, no guess. So if you have no guess, just look at the first step. What is the law at the first step? It's uniform. If you start at some point where you assume that you have the uniform measure, it's very easy to see that actually it's, um, the uniform measure is preserved at the next step. So imagine that your walk is staying, so it's uniform here, and it stays on this uh, line at the first step. What is the probability that it is at some point? So if, it is, if it's here, it's that it, uh, it arrives from here or here. So it has a probability 1 over 3 to, to be here. But here is the same thing, actually. You can arrive with probability 1 over 6 from here, but you can also arrive with probability 1 over 6 from yourself. So conditionally to the place of your walk at the step before, it's still uniform. If you go down, it will be the same thing. You can check that here you can arrive from these two guys with probability 1 over 6. And when you, if you go up, you see that all these guys, you arrive with probability 1 third. And this guy, you can only arrive from this vertex, but we put exactly the right weight so that the probability to arrive here is one third. So the law of this coordinate, coordinate at every time, it's uniform. So in particular, the law of the heating time here, the 
the place where you heat here, so let's say that you will arrive through here, is completely uniform on the top side. OK? So now, when the mesh size goes to 0, what is the scaling limit of this object? What does it look like? Everybody that can give me an information of this will be mostly welcome. So inside, what does it look like when you look at the scaling limit of this object, but not on the boundary? That's just a simple random motion, yes, because you are a simple walk, random walk. And on the boundary, that's something a little bit special. Somehow is not reflected like a real Brunian motion. It has a push away from zero. So, I mean, that's not a big step to imagine that this random walk, x1 over n, that this random walk converges at the limit, so when n goes to infinity, to some Brownian motion-like process. It's just a Brownian motion, but on the boundary, it's reflected with an angle, which is exactly 2 pi over 3 in this case. So this will be a reflected Brownian motion with an angle 2 pi over 3. So this kind of reflected Brownian motion, you can construct it directly at the limit. That's a continuum object that you can construct. It's not exactly straightforward to do it, but you can do it. So now if I look at the image of this random, this reflected Brownian motion in another domain, so mapped by some conformal map F in another domain. What does it look like, this reflected Brownian motion? Actually, it looks like exactly a Brownian motion reflected also in this domain, exactly what you would like to define directly in this domain. Why? Because inside, anyway, you are a Brownian motion. And Brownian motion is conformally invariant. So what you will see inside the domain is obviously a Brownian motion. And on the boundary, we did this reflection with some angle. But remember that conformal maps, they preserve the angle. So locally in this new domain, you will have exactly a reflection that will be somehow always with some angle of 2 pi over 3 away from some point which is the image of 0. So here you will really have an object like this. So what I just wanted to explain here and briefly, because I don't want to enter into the technicalities of the definition, is that you can define a reflected Brownian motion with some angle on the boundary, and that's a conformally uh, invariant object. So now the question is the following. You consider this reflected Brownian motion, say, in the upper half plane, and you stop it at the first time you, you reflect it here, so away here and away here, and you look at it until it touches these parts, the parts that are away from minus 1, 1. And when you have this, you saw this morning that there is something natural to do is to feel completely your Brownian motion. You forget about what is happening inside. You only remember about the boundaries. So what is the law of this process? Or at least, what could be a strategy to understand the law of this process? So this morning, we had exactly the same kind of process. It was a process that was starting the, the restriction measure was a process that was starting at 0, only touching at 0 the boundary. And we saw that a good 
way of understanding this problem was to take a hull and to look at the probability that this uh, big uh, potato eats uh, the hull. So let's try to do the same thing here. Let's take a hull. So you see the start here is corresponding to the end. To the end, since I stop my process exactly at the point where it touched the boundary, there is a unique point here which touches the boundary. So what is the probability that, or how can I express nicely the probability that this um, Brownian motion actually touch this, um, this hull? So I have a conformally invariant object and somebody crazy in front of me, so me, draw something with a triangle. So what can you do in this case? You can try to map your ugly domain to the triangle and see what happens. So let's map this domain, so edge minus A, to the triangle, the equilateral triangle. And let's map it in such a way that one is sent to this point. So this will be phi of one. This is phi of zero. And here, phi of minus one. And the boundary of A will be some set here. So now, what is the probability in terms of phi? What is the probability that this reflected Brownian motion actually intersects A? Because we have a uniform measure, it's just the length of the image of the boundary. So the probability that the reflected Brownian motion hits a, so we touch A, like this, so let's say car intersect A. This is exactly the length of phi of the boundary of A. Okay. So I reformulate my question. I wanted to identify this process. Do you know another process that satisfies exactly the same property? That satisfies that the probability to intersect, to intersect A is exactly the length of phi of the boundary. <laughs> it has a fancy name, but that's the Cardi formula for SLE. The SLE 6 has exactly this property. And actually, it was the case here. SAD6 has exactly this property. When you start an SAD6 and you let it bump and you stop it at the first time it reaches the top, the law of uh, the point at the top is exactly uniform on, uh, on the top. So it means that this length, it's also the probability for SAD6 starting in, this, in the upper half plane and stop at the first time you reach this area, the orange area, to intersect A. So. And exactly like in this morning, when you know that for all the hulls like this, if you know the probability for all the hulls, it determines you, the law of your, your, your process. So what I wrote here is exactly what I need to deduce that reflected Brownian, the hull of the reflected Brownian motion, or the feeling, sorry, reflected Brownian motion, it's in fact S86. So that's the first kind of weird uh, property, uh, I mean, identities between different uh, conformally invariant objects. Okay? 
So we don't have a lot of time, so I will not enter into too many details. But now if you do the same thing, you start an S86 at 1. So and you stop it at the first time it reaches the small circle of radius epsilon. And just a condition that it does not disconnect 0 from some point on the boundary. This thing is actually the same as the following. You send a Brownian motion, a reflected Brownian motion, from 1, and you stop it at the first time it reaches the boundary. It reaches a small circle. So this thing is exactly the equivalent of this thing, but in another context. For people that are wondering why I'm disconnecting, I'm forcing 0 to be disconnected from e to the i x, it's because I want morally that this thing, this thing to be on the boundary of my domain. What I did here, I was stopping my SAD and my Brownian motion on the boundary. And if I don't say anything about this point that, doesn't, that is not disconnected from 0, it means that I'm stopping my SLE inside the domain. And that's not possible. If I say that it's disconnected from, zero, from this point, it means that somewhere, I don't know where, but somewhere, there is a curve that is actually disconnecting 0 from e to the i x. So somehow this point, this boundary is not, is not inside your domain. It's on the boundary. So I, I mean, to make sense of that, that's not very hard. But I guess already that's a lot of things. So I will not prove the thing. It's not very difficult. But really, the thing is that you need here to enforce or to assume. I don't know that e to the i x is not disconnected from 0. So you, you, are, you stop it at the time where it reaches a small circle, but you are not disconnected, disconnecting the point from 0. So you cannot do a whole turn around your small circle. OK. So that was the first identity I wanted to present. I know that it's fast, but we will need it later. I need another one. I mean, in the class, you saw radial SLE. You saw chordal SLE. You saw some SLE kappa, radi radial SLE kappa, chordal SLE kappa, but you never saw the connection between them. So Vincent told you that locally it should look the same because the radial uh, Lovner equation locally, it boils down to the chordal one. But in the case of one specific SLE, it's much better. The situation is much better. So if I want to compare. SLE kappa, chordal SLE kappa, and radial SLE kappa, what I do is that, so I have, say, a chordal SLE kappa from 1 to e to the i x, say. So this is a chordal SLE kappa. And I take a radial SLE kappa, so that goes to 0. If I want to compare these two processes, what I can do is I can, I can map the both, both processes to the upper half plane. So let's map these two processes to the upper half plane. What you will see is that this process, by conformal invariance of SLE, it will exactly give you a chordal SLE in the upper half plane. But this process, it has no reason to give you a chordal SLE in the upper half plane. What it will give you is a growing hull in the upper half plane. You will have something that is growing, 
And that is, if you send 0 to infinity, so you send 0 to infinity, it will give you a growing hull. So you, actually, you cannot do that. But let's say you map this to the upper half plane. You have a growing hull. And so you can hope that that's like a chordal SLE or like an SLE, but it's not exactly an SLE. So what you will get is exactly like yesterday evening, you will get a Lovner-like equation. It won't be a Lovner equation, but something that looks pretty much the same. And like yesterday, what you will like to do is to parameterize, reparameterize your curve somehow in such a way that it's, you can, it's better looking. And the way we saw yesterday is that you want your ME point, so infinity, to see the curve at the right speed. So we do, imagine we do the same kind of computation as yesterday. And what we will get is that actually, we parameterize, my curve will be of this kind for some driving process beta t. That can, exactly like yesterday, this alpha s, we derive what it was. It will be the same thing here. You can compute beta t tilde of t. And in general, beta tilde is not a Brownian motion. So it means that this is not a chordal SLE in general. What you will see is that d of beta tilde of t, if you started with an SLE kappa, it will give you that. And here you will have a function, a of t, say dt. You will have a drift. But in front of this drift, you can uh, compute, and you will have, so uh, I'm going to do something wrong, but something like kappa over 2 minus 3 or something like this. You will have something that depends on kappa. When you plug kappa equals 6 in this equation, what you get is that all this drift vanishes, and you are back with an SLE 6 with a Brownian motion. So the image of your radial SLE will give you exactly a chordal SLE. So of course, what I did is true until some point. I mean, obviously, that's not the same processes. And the point where you have to stop to do this kind of black magic is exactly when e to the ix becomes disconnected. from zero. So this SLE, if it doesn't disconnect zero from e to the ix, it's really running exactly like an SLE here, a radial SLE. And that's very logic when you think about this SLE 6 philosophy. It's local, so it doesn't see if he's aiming for zero or e to the ix. But until as soon as he starts to disconnect either in this model or this model, you start to disconnect e to the ix from 0, then it becomes two different models. One will be aiming for e to the ix. So somehow here, we don't know if I'm drawing an SLE 6, a chordal SLE 6, or a radial SLE 6. As soon as I touch here, the difference will be that radial SLE 6 will bump inside because it's aiming for 0, but chordal SLE 6 will do something else. It will bump outside because he is aiming for e to the ix. OK? So the philosophy is that corridor is 36, radial is 36. They are the same up to the time where they, see that they have to go to different points. OK. So that was the two ingredients I needed, these two equivalents between two different objects. And now, we can start, at least try to, to give a sketch of how we would derive uh, intersecting of intersection exponents for Brownian motion. So we want to estimate the intersection of two Brownian motions. And you are going to be very nice with me. You are going to allow me to do many bad things. So I have to choose in which order I will do them. OK. 
So the first thing that I will say is that looking at the intersection between two Brownian motions, it's a little bit the same as looking at the intersection of one Brownian motion with one excursion. So I will, I will say, no, the blue one doesn't have the right to enter into the small ball. That's forbidden for, for it. So let's say that that's a little bit like the probability. So this time I have a Brownian motion starting uniformly on the boundary of this small disk. And I have an excursion, really, going from this point to this boundary to this one. So this one is not allowed anymore to enter here. So of course, I didn't justify this. And there is something to justify. But imagine that already when you take a Brownian motion that starts on the boundary, you forget about the red one. The blue one is not going to enter a lot inside at least with probability logarithm of 1 over logarithm of 1 over epsilon, for instance, so something logarithmic in epsilon, you can force it to go to exit very fast from this small circle. And this logarithm will not do anything in the probability that we are trying to estimate. We are trying to estimate something which is a power of epsilon. So let's say up to logarithm, so up to this kind of thing, I can assume that, OK? So now when I have one excursion and one Brownian motion starting from here, what I can say is that this is exactly equal to the probability. I have still my excursion. And this time I will start my first Brownian motion from 0. I start my Brownian motion from 0, and I hope that it will not exit, it will not touch the blue uh, trajectory before exiting. These two, two probabilities they are exactly equal. Why? Because when you start your Brownian motion, until it exits the, the, for the first time the small circle, of course it didn't touch this cushion, which is outside of the circle. But now the remaining of the curve is exactly a Brownian motion started uniformly on the small disk. So these two things, they are exactly the same. OK, so that was my first cheating. I will do my second one. So via rotational invariance, I can assume that actually my excursion is starting from 1. So that's not cheating. That's just invariance of the rotation. And now my second cheating is that I will assume that I can start not an excursion, but a reflected Brownian motion. So why is it true? Same thing as here. Up to a logarithm. I can enforce this trajectory not to bump too far. Just to bump in a very small neighborhood here, and after to go to the small disk. It will cost me a, log a logarithm to do that. So actually, the, fa the fact that it bumps or not is not really uh, of any matter in, a, in our case, because anyway, this one, this red uh, Brownian motion, will not see this small neighborhood. They try to avoid each other, so it's not going to try to go there. OK? But now, this blue curve, it's a reflected Brownian motion. And obviously, it does not disconnect 0, say, from a random point on the boundary, because otherwise, it means that it has done a whole turn, and the red Brownian motion has no chance to, uh, to avoid it. So this process is a reflected Brownian motion, and it did not, and it does not disconnect. Zero from the boundary. So in this case. I know from what I did earlier that that's like a chordal SLE, 
which didn't, did not disconnect zero from the boundary. And what I did here is that this caudal SLE, it's like a radial SLE that did not disconnect uh, the boundary from zero. So actually, this probability, it's a probability that an SLE6, a radial SLE6, that I draw very, very, very poorly, avoid the Brownian motion. This is a radial SLE6. OK. So what I can do here, perhaps, I can do, OK, I condition on this blue curve. And so I look at the expectation of the probability that my red curve, my red Brownian motion, exits the domain knowing the blue curve, knowing the blue curve. That's what I want to estimate. Okay, that's just a rewriting of the same thing. Okay, what is the probability that the Brownian motion exits this domain without touching the blue curve, in terms of the blue curve? By conformal invariance, that's the same thing as looking at the problem map by that GT. So I look at this thing. I, so let's say instead of epsilon, let's say a necessarily up to time logarithm of epsilon. We saw several times that that's the same thing, taking a necessarily that goes until touching the small uh, circle or an SLE that goes until, that runs at in time logarithm of uh, one over epsilon. So we will do that. So this thing, I can map it back by G of logarithm of one over epsilon, and I can use conformal invariance. So this picture will be sent to the following picture. This is the part of the boundary corresponding to the SLE6. And I have my burn and motion starting at zero. And it must exist, it must exit on the white curve. Why is it a Brownian motion? By conformal invariance. So in other words, for people that know uh, complex analysis, the probability that this point exits the domain, it's the, the harmonic measure of this arc in the domain. And by conformal invariance of harmonic measures, that's the harmonic measure of this thing. OK. So I want to estimate the harmonic measure of this. So it's the length of the image of this thing. So the image of this thing, that's all the points not disconnected. at time logarithm of 1 over epsilon. So if you prefer now the length of this thing, that's the integral between 0 and 2 pi of g prime of 1 over epsilon of all the points that were not disconnected at time logarithm of 1 over epsilon. And this, this is what I, uh, we were calling H. So this thing, it's exactly uh, the length of this arc. You take the arc composed of all the x that are not disconnected. You look at the image of the length of the, uh, the, the image by gt, by g logarithm of 1 over epsilon. So this is the length. And so if I want the probability, I just have to divide by the total length. So the probability I'm looking at is the expectation 
of 1 over 2 pi times this thing. OK? But now, you believe me that this thing, we can compute it. We have done it already several times. If I simplify the notation, what I want to compute is this kind of thing. I want to compute this and to integrate it against uh, and to do the integral, 1 over 2 pi, the integral in dx. OK, so this thing, that's exactly like before. I will not do the computation again. But that's some function that is solution of a PDE. Exactly as before, you, somehow we have finished the first step. We have written our problem, the first step of our scheme of yesterday. We have written the problem in some conformal way involving SLEs. And now this thing, I can do extract what is exactly the, the diffusion that is interesting in my problem that would be the, the same as before and express this in terms of this uh, diffusion and I will find that this thing is solution of uh, of this function this equation sorry of this PD where L kappa is exactly the same as before, so it's one half of uh, so it's one half of six f second six f second plus um, so one over so cotangent of x over two f prime. So same kind of thing as before, and here you can do the same technology, and you will find that f of x t when t goes to infinity, it behaves like e to the minus 5 over 4 times t. So when you plug it at time logarithm of 1 over epsilon, you get that all this thing here is of order of epsilon to the 5 over 4. OK? So I just sketch the proof to you. Of course, I went fast, but we don't have a lot of time. And you get this exponent just by doing the same kind of computation we did already too many times. Just to finish, what you can deduce with that is the following very nice exponent. And it seems that that's the only way to deduce it. You cannot do it in a discrete level. You take two, you take two random walks. one white and one red, until, until time n. What is the probability that they do not intersect? So what is the probability that two random walks starting at the same point do not intersect before the n the nth step. Please. <laughs> Don't let me alone. OK, so it's obviously related to what we did before. So one guess, at least like this, I can uh, be angry or angry or happy. 5 over 8, yes. So why, five or f why do we have 5 over 8 and not 5 over 4? Just because two random walks that go during 8 steps, they are typically at length square root of n. So there is this square root of n that you must not uh, forget. So that's typically th that's the story. If you want to do this thing without SLE, I mean, Nobody knows how to do it. Via SLE, it starts to be something explainable, perhaps not in one hour, because 
I went too fast, but in one hour and a half, it's way enough. And you see, you start to play with different kind of, uh, of SLEs, of uh, conformally invariant objects. We started from an SLE, but we connected it to radio SLE and after the, uh, to corridor SLE. And after this corridor SLE, you connect it to this reflected Brownian motion. And by the way, these kind of things give you a hint that if you are able to compute dimension, Hausdorff dimensions for SLEs, you have a good chance to be able to compute Hausdorff dimensions for Brownian motions and things like this. So for instance, here what you know is that the Hausdorff dimension of the boundary of, an SA, of a Brownian motion would be the same as the Hausdorff dimension of the boundary of a SAD6. And this morning, you saw another thing, which was that the boundary of five, SLE, uh, five random uh, Brownian motion was the same as the boundary of eight SLE eight third. So you had that the Hausdorff dimension of an, of a, the, an SLE eight third is the same as the Hausdorff dimension of the boundary of a Brownian motion. And yesterday, I didn't prove to you that the Hausdorff dimension of SLE eight third is four over four, four third, sorry. But if you know that, you did use Mandelbrot conjecture that uh, the, the, the Hausdorff dimension of the boundary of Brownian motion is four over three. And just to finish with that, you see this boundary of SLE6, it has the same, uh, it has the same um, house of dimension that SLE excerpt, finally, because it has the same dimension as the boundary of Brownian motion. And actually, that's not a coincidence. It's expected that, it's expected that the boundary of an SLE kappa is very, very strongly related to uh, an SLE 16 over kappa. So if you plug 6 in this story, you get 8 third. So this is a connection which is much more general than only for 6. And that's the kind of thing that we will not see, but which are a wonderful question in this area. Thank you very much. You are free. Oh, you are not free. From the boundary. So, so, he, no, so here, when you start here, you just start them uniformly on the disk. So two, uh, yeah, both uniformly. Here it was still both uniformly, but this one was an excursion this time. It was not allowed to come back. And here you start it on the other side. Yeah. Of this statement? Yeah. So, okay, 